Now solving biological problems by engineering living cells. NewsHour correspondent Tom Bearden has this science unit report on the emerging field of synthetic biology. More than 800 college kids from all over the world celebrating the end of months of intense work building biological machines. These were the final moments of the 2008 International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, or IGEM, on the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge. We are from Peggy University. <laughs> These young people spent their summer on their home campuses doing something called synthetic biology a new way to approach solving the world's problems using living organisms. The annual iGEM Jamboree gives them the chance to show off all that work through a series of presentations. The team from Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium, invented Dr. Coli. This is a self-regulating drug delivery system. It senses inflammation factors on a certain place in the body of the patient and on, it reacts by producing the appropriate amount of drugs on that place. When the patient isn't ill anymore, Dr. Coli will eliminate himself out of the body. The Duke team focused on building bacteria to attack plastic waste in landfills to make it biodegradable. Mississippi State worked on breaking down the tough cell walls of woody plants so they can be converted into biofuel. And Rice University invented BioBeer. Their goal was to engineer a yeast that would produce resveratrol during the brewing process. Resveratrol is the substance found in red wine that's been shown to greatly extend life in simple organisms. At times, a layman who wandered into a presentation might have wondered what language they were speaking. This is the TAL gene under the expression, under the regulation by the ADH1 promoter. And with teams from 21 countries here, there were certainly a lot of languages other than English being spoken in the hallways. But everybody seemed to understand the common language of synthetic biology, even if jet lag occasionally took some people out of the discussion. Synthetic biology is something of a departure from traditional biology. The basic concept is to build a biological machine, modify an existing organism using standard parts, much like an engineer might design and build a computer using off-the-shelf microchips and circuit boards. Randy Retberg is a professor at MIT and iGEM director. Biology, like you learn in high school, is a discovery science. You're trying to find how the world works and then do something interesting based on that knowledge that you've, that you've achieved. Synthetic biology is more of an engineering activity. It's really building new things that didn't exist before. Retberg and others have established a parts bin, or library of biological parts at MIT. Some of it is housed in a freezer in Retberg's lab. They call these bits of DNA and other materials bio bricks. So we're dealing with bacteria, right? So we've got lots of DNA floating around. Like all of the teams that participated in iGEM this year, the team from Brown University got its bio bricks delivered by mail in the form of a loose leaf binder. The bricks were dried on filter paper. They punched out tiny circles of paper containing the parts they thought would do the work they wanted them to accomplish, multiplied them, and then implanted them inside bacteria. Professor Gary Wessel is the team's faculty sponsor. Do they come up with ideas that surprise you? All the time. Tom, this is, I think, one of the joys of the job. Uh, I am constantly learning in this profession, and the students are the best teachers, oftentimes. The idea the team came up with this year was to create a cheap way of detecting the presence of toxic material in water, something that could be enormously valuable in countries that can't afford major laboratory facilities. Harvard professor Pamela Silver thinks synthetic biology has incredible potential. The green bottle has um, photosynthetic bacteria in it, and our hope is to um, use these bacteria. They can harvest sunlight and live on sunlight and use them to produce biofuels, for example, hydrogen or um, biodiesel. I think there are people saying this is the future of technology in biology. Uh, and so that makes it just as exciting. We're not all going to go out and be professors and academics. Instead, can I go out and save the world, for example? So there is this sense of I can change the world. Well, if you can yeah. make fuel out of sunlight, that We're would change gonna the world. We're going to do it, man. <laughs> this is gonna, you're going to have this growing on your roof. <laughs> okay, I did my way. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Here. 
Matt Cowell, one of the original organizers of iGEM, had the honor of announcing the finalists called from the day-long round of presentations. NYMU Taipei. Cowell is something of an evangelist for synthetic biology. He wants to democratize the field, essentially create a core of amateur bioengineers who could contribute without investing years of their lives in graduate degrees. He points to people who build computers in their garages as a model for what he has in mind. To further that idea, Cowell and Jason Bobe co-founded an organization called DIY Bio, or Do-It-Yourself Biology. They held the group's first organizational meeting in this pub earlier this year. We sent out this email saying, hey, community, we're really interested in do-it-yourself biology. We're not sure what that means yet. Here are some ideas about what that could mean. Let's get together and figure it out. And so we emailed that out to very few mailing lists, just a couple. And uh, we met here at 7 o'clock uh, like four months ago and five months ago. And uh, some really cool people showed up, including some real academics, like heavy hitters from Harvard and MIT. So it was cool to see them in the room with like computer scientists, with like high school students. DIY Bio had another meeting at MIT recently where Cowell and Bo broached the idea of building public laboratories where enthusiasts could conduct experiments. And we sort of came up with some main ideas. We should be safe, open, responsible. We should... Even though there are regulations that make it difficult to procure certain types of biological material, some find opening the field to amateurs worrisome. Roger Brent, the director of the Molecular Sciences Institute at the University of California at San Francisco, thinks some sort of oversight is necessary for do-it-yourself biology. Reluctantly, no, I don't trust them to regulate themselves. I don't see it as plausible that a person, perhaps even a teenager, uh, would be allowed to build and release uh, an animal virus that could be transmitted to human to human. The, the kind of regulation I'm talking about can only happen at a national level and it only makes sense if it's done in concert with uh, harmonized uh, regulations uh, in other countries. This is exactly the model of driver's licenses, pilot's licenses, radio operator's licenses. Jason Bob also thinks there should be safety rules, but not necessarily government regulations. By having an organization who wants to promote, on the one hand, innovation and education and learning, it's also a great opportunity for us to help be innovators in regulatory policy and safety, too. Back at the iGEM award ceremony, the Brown team's hard work paid off with a major award. Our second area award for environment, best environment application, was awarded to Brown University. But when it came time to give the grand prize, a metallic representation of a bio brick, pranksters had hidden it. The, the judges do not know where the brick is. Pardon? Under the table! You got some soda. It was eventually given to the team from Slovenia for its effort to create a synthetic vaccine against Helicobacter pylori, a bacteria that infects half the world with ulcers and other gastric problems. From five teams in 2004, the competition grew to 84 this year. Organizers expect it to be even bigger next year. So they're starting a new research project, figuring out how to pay for moving up to a major convention center. Finally tonight, an encore of essayist Ann Taylor Fleming's story of a young woman fighting for survival. The calls come with regrettable frequency. Another friend or friend of a friend has been diagnosed with breast cancer, the disease that seems to hang over our gender like the sword of Damocles. Mostly, they are women in midlife, over 40. But when the someone is young, like Dikla Benzivi, who was 32 when first diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer six years ago, the diagnosis seems crueler and sadder. I was completely shocked. I think the world just stopped. The sound died. It was just really quiet. And I, I went to la vie like such is life. But I'm like, you know, you go through school for 12 or 16 years 
to create a career and learn what to do in life and then all of a sudden you're given a week or two to decide what to do for cancer therapy? There are 11,000 women under the age of 40 diagnosed